for this last seminar is Miriam Miriam from UBC. Miriam is a um, keen learning and senior marine data scientist um, in the group's Martin McEwen at the Pacific Parkinson's Research Center and the Center for Brain Health at UBC. Uh, so Miriam studies brain and behavioral data recorded from patients with Parkinson's disease to help um, understand at a clinical level how ongoing brain activity during motor tasks is affected in these patients. And um, I think this is what we'll be telling us here today, uh, focusing on human stimulus as a novel treatment for Parkinson's disease. Uh, looking forward to your comments. Okay, thank you so much. May I start? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, welcome to the idea talk titled Precision Stimulus of Neuromodulation as a Novel Treatment for Parkinson's Disease. Here you see the list of my colleagues and collaborators. I think some of them are in the call, so hopefully we'll have a good discussion at the end. Uh, here I'm showing you the outline of my presentation. Uh, we'll start with some general concepts regarding the project, and then we'll move to some explanation regarding the, uh, the chain that I am showing here, stimulation to brain to behavior, and how we can bypass one step uh, by the game-based optimization. And then we move to brain biomarker discovery. So let's start with the general concepts first. Uh, Parkinson is treated mainly uh, based on the medication. Uh, there is some almost new technique for treatment called deep brain stimulation, which needs uh, surgery and it is invasive. That's why we are thinking that maybe non-invasive brain stimulation techniques could be uh, considered as a complementary approach for treatment. And what kind of uh, non-invasive uh, brain stimulation are we talking about in this project? It's based on electrical vestibular stimulation or EVS, or the other name that we usually use is galvanic vestibular stimulation, GVS. So how does it work? It uh, We put some electrodes behind the ears of the participants uh, through the mass and we stimulate to the mastoid process and uh, with a mild electrical current that uh, people usually can't feel. So although people can't feel or realize uh, the stimulation, uh, we'll show you that uh, it can modulate brain waves in Parkinson's disease. And here I'm showing you some very few examples of how a cellular system uh, can function for the human uh, activities. It's not a comprehensive list, but it shows that uh, the cellular system has widely distributed effects across the cortex. And the most interesting part of this uh, project might be that you can think about EVS as song that needs to be customized or individualized to be most effective. So what kind of... PD symptoms we can potentially target with EVS. There are a range of uh, symptoms. Uh, many of them, uh, or a few of them are being followed in our lab uh, with EVS, for example, sleep and postural hypotension are two current studies that we are following. Uh, and here I'm showing you the main motor behavior, uh, the main motor uh, assessment that we are um, dealing with motor vigor. So that's the experiment um, setup or protocol that Dr. Sujin Lee used for her um, PhD. And I brought this slide here to explain that people are asked to squeeze the bulb as fast as possible, as strong as possible, while they receive also EVS behind their ears. And yeah, that's that's the uh, protocol. But now we have a, an all dressed setup. It, it means that we have EEG, GVS, uh, fMRI, and also we are doing the motor task. So that's called, that's why we call it all dressed study. And uh, in the, in this study, we are uh, um, we have uh, flexibility in terms of selecting uh, the stimulation type. 
it's it's different from DBS that they only use one specific type because it's external. It could be constant, pulse train, random noise, sinusoid, or multi-sign as Dr. Lee employed in her thesis, or it can be amplitude modulated. And I'm showing here that how amplitude modulation uh, signal can be composed by using an envelope frequency and a carrier frequency. So by combining these two, we have an amplitude modulated signal. So th that's the signal that we want to, uh, that's like a message signal, which is being carried over the carrier signal. So here I'm showing you some preliminary or preliminary, preliminary in terms of the bigger project that we are currently working on it from the uh, PhD research uh, done by Dr. Lee. So that's a joint analysis from uh, brain to behavior. And as you see, for example, based on the two stimuli that has been employed, the greatest effect is being, um, re is being achieved by EVS1, which is a multi-sign 50 to 100 Hertz. And it has the greatest effect in terms of beta event related desynchronization. And it has the greatest effect in this PD off med group as well. And the, in the right panel, uh, you see that uh, based on a discriminant correlation analysis that has been done to find the combination or linear combination of all these uh, behavioral metrics, uh, we found that again, EVS1 shows the greatest effect. Um, so th these are the res promising results that we achieved. And based on these results, it seems that because there is a large intersubject variability, which is uh, different across stimuli and across subjects, if we can individual individualize purposefully across subjects and optimize for individual uh, participants, then maybe EVS could be more effective and uh, bring better results. So the critical question would be how we can individualize this stimuli to make it um, the most effective. And that makes EVS a complementary therapy for Parkinson. That, that brings us to the second general concept, which is vigor. How do we dis, uh, um, define vigor? Um, Actually, decision to move uh, is an economic decision that th the one who wants to put some effort uh, should uh, uh, allocate that effort to acquire reward. So if a movement seem, uh, if that is, uh, that movement is rewarding enough, maybe uh, the resultant movement is, uh, faster and the latency is shorter. So yeah, that's the way vigor is defined. And uh, yeah, Schadmer, who is the biggest uh, big name in um, neuroscience, uh, thinks that by, 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 pre by predicting uh, vigor, we can do many big things uh, in future. So that's the target of uh, uh, prediction in terms of uh, many future big aims. So the thing that, and as a proxy for uh, motor vigor, the way we defined it, we are um, using a reaction time and time to peak as I showed here. So from the time that they see the go signal, they start to move uh, and then the, when they reach to the maximum pressure, uh, which is the peak movement, actually we consider this, uh, the, the summation of these two temporal uh, signals. So that uh, brings us to the interesting part of the talk, which is interactive game-based optimization. Here you see all pieces of the project together. Uh, we have to employ some um, calibration stimuli and find some biomarkers, imaging biomarker, EEG-based biomarkers, and then based on optimization, you find the best stimuli and then get the best 
reaction time, for example. But let's, for example, let's uh, think why do we need GVS brain behavior all together? Can't we remove brain from this puzzle and just directly go from stimulation to behavior? That uh, means that from a low dimensional space, we have to go directly to the, another low dimensional space, which might not be feasible because the search in these two dimensions uh, could be exhaustively intractable. But, and by bringing the brain to the problem, we are actually making it smarter by searching over the bio, target biomarkers that is uh, connected to the motor behavior that we are targeting. But for now, let's assume that we can, <coughs> we can remove brain from here and just do it with no brain. So if we remove brain for, for now and try to map GVS to behavior directly, then maybe we can, because that's ideal talk, maybe we can think that people with PD can play some games which is challenging and engaging. And because they are playing that game continuously, so the error uh, of their performance is also a continuous measure that we have. And we are employing some different stimuli in the background. So we can see in which area of the game, in which part of the game associated with that type of GBS, we will see the best performance. And people also can feel for themselves in which part of the game they did the best. So with these ideas in mind, uh, we designed a Canadian game, Team Beat and Donut. <laughs> so, the, so the Team Beat and Donut moves uh, with some random wins and the people with Parkinson should put the donut, uh, Team Beat in the donut. So both, as I said, both of them moves with some random wins and the error is being uh, calculated as a, uh, as you see here, uh, as the distance between these two centers. So how we can make it complicated because we want it to be unpredictable and also uh, removable because we want to see the, the, the part of the error which is solely because of the human error which is possibly could be affected by GVS. That's the uh, two, uh, seemingly contradicting goals that we have. And also if we can remove this, maybe we get consistency across trials, which makes the analysis much, much easier. So the idea is that maybe by combining these two like this, so X uh, is sinusoid of NT and Y is sinusoid of T, then we can get some Lissajou figures, as you see here, complex harmonic motion patterns, and then these both donut and timbit are mo could move uh, according to these team these Lisa Joe figures. So obviously we don't show these paths to the participant, but we we the game moves these two in these paths, so uh, it looks uh, very complicated, but also removable in terms of our analysis behind the scenes. Okay, so that brings me to the uh, main section that also includes the brain into the play. So we, we are talking about stimulation, brain and behavior, both, all of them together. So there are multiple complementary alternatives for biomarker discovery. Uh, let's, uh, and as you see, we are now uh, talking about a stimulation to brain section, this section. And so let's talk about the approach number one, microstates. So microstates can be taught uh, atoms of EG states. And uh, the proponents of this approach thinks that brain discontinuously switches between approximately four quasi-stable states, which are, get, which are um, actually, we can, these four states uh, come from a k-means on the GFP global field power of the EEG that you are seeing on top. So this is the topography and this is the associated uh, brain macro states for that. And uh, for that, for our uh, population of PD, uh, we get the macro state, the four macro states that 
uh, I just discussed in the uh, different conditions of different stimuli and met off, met on, healthy. And uh, yeah, when we, when we have these microstates and we extract some features from these, then we can think how the effect of medication, which is the target, uh, could be similar to the effect of our, uh, for example, our two multi-sign EVS that we had employed. So we want to see how the change of uh, microstate features uh, is seen as a result of medication and which one is confirmed with, with uh, one specific EVS. And in this case, we see that EVS2 does the same uh, change uh, similar to the medication. Now let's look at the other uh, approach. The other approach is based on uh, a theory which is called Krupman theory. That's a um, theory in, in, in control, which um, uh, changes the coordinate uh, from a linear regime to uh, from a nonlinear regime to a linear regime with, uh, with defining a, a Krupman operator called K. So if we linearize the regime, then we can analyze, predict, and control much, much easier than a nonlinear system. So in this study, we used a paper from Nathan Coots and Steve Brunton and their uh, nature paper network. And uh, to get the, this K, K or this Koopman operator, we used deep neural networks and this autoencoder-like architecture to get the, and, linearized system. So by, by then looking at the trajectory of the movements in this uh, latent Koopman space, we see that the effect of uh, GVS and the effect of medication is seen in a very uh, understandable and, um, space, low dimensional space. And then by looking at how the uh, part or participant has moved as a result of GVS or as a result of medication, we see that, for example, reaction time shows a great correlation with the distance from sham healthy group, which means the target group that we want to uh, consider as a target because we want our Parkinsonian patients to be more normal like. So if we consider the change from this group, that would be meaningful as a meaningful metric. Uh, yeah. So that brings me to the final part of my talk, which is uh, another um, complementary approach for biomarker discovery. Uh, it is related to brain to behavior stage to this part. So uh, we tried and extracted many EEG features, time like to the um, reaching the maximum force, that P max that I showed you in a few slides ago. So. Uh, we could predict motor vigor out of those EEG features in, in healthy group and in Parkinsonian group um, uh, fairly accurately. And it shows that uh, cortically based EEG signals uh, may provide information to create motor vigor biomarker. So although we may think that because motor vigor may be encoded in basal ganglia, which is uh, not uh, recordable by EEG and it needs fMRI, but we got some hopeful results using those EEG features. There, are, there were some limitations for that study because we didn't have enough trials so that we can dig into or, or elaborate into uh, within participant analysis, but it's natural, it's obvious because uh, elderly could not tolerate uh, studying, uh, coming to the lab and participating as a volunteer and receiving so many uh, trials of GVS. So that's the nature of the problem that we are dealing with. And also the standard EG features that we had extracted were very uh, bounded to um, some specific type of features, time domain, frequency domain, and time frequency domain features. So it was very limited. So we think that maybe by looking at deep neural networks that extract the features are being extracted with, with no hu human hand-designed features, it may 
be useful. So if, we want, if I want to compare Koopman-based macro state and hand design features, maybe I can summarize that Koopman has a theory behind it and also it gives us a mo model that we can interpret, but it has problem in high dimensional data. Um, macro state is easy to interpret, but it's unable to capture uh, detailed dynamics of the uh, brain dynamics. So, uh, and also uh, the last approach is very appropriate for our uh, data because it's not deep, it's classical machine learning, but hand uh, picking features is not easy. So yeah, that was my uh, talk. So that's a, as a conclusion, I can show you that uh, in order to have all pieces of the puzzle, we need stimulation to brain and brain to behavior both together we employ some uh, calibration stimuli and find uh, some biomarkers that predict uh, behavior. And then by looking at those, uh, uh, by looking at those biomarkers and uh, optimizing the best uh, stimulation, then we have a, the, the best stimulation to employ. And uh, that's the, maybe the ultimate goal of this project. The Parkinsonian patient has uh, slow of movement, but as soon as the stimulation gets turned on, you see that the movement gets very normal like. We, that's the portable, uh, that's the portable version one of our stimulation uh, stimulator. We are also building another version which is um, appropriate for a stimulation during the sleep study. So that's the version two that we are currently in fact manufacturing. Uh, thank you so much. Again, I'm reminding you that this work has been done with the collaboration of all these uh, good collaborators that I had. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Miriam. No problem. Thank you. Really exciting talk. Um... Do you have a question? Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm just wondering if you could expand on your results regarding EEG microstates and like which specific microstate did you find your results around and what dynamics behind it? Did you, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, after extracting those microstates uh, to topographies that I showed you, uh, we extracted a few features, for example, duration, coverage, occurrence, and transition probabilities. And then by having these features, then we could look at the feature importance in terms of disease severity estimation, which because we had the UPDRS or disease severity score for the patients. And also we had the, both cases of medication off and on. So by classifying off versus on in terms of these features, and also by looking how sh no esteem versus esteem one, esteem two that we had employed, we could get uh, three distinct set of features. I call them disease-related features, medication-related features, and stimulation-related features. And then then I, we could look how, um, because medication could be considered as a target, we want the brain biomarker to change the similar way to the change that uh, medication uh, changed the, change them. So we considered this as a target and uh, the, feature, the feature of the, the feature set that we chose for looking at this investigation was the feature set that intersects with the disease related features because those that could con that those that could predict the disease severity very accurately could probably be the most relevant set of features that we need to look at them so then based on the direction that these intersection of these two features could change we found the best simulation uh, um, criterion those that act like those uh, medication could be the best in terms of, yeah. So we found that, for example, uh, duration duration of, of microstate D, duration of microstate A, or uh, coverage of microstate C and the transition from of D to B uh, could uh, change like this. One, two of them should decrease, these two should increase in order 
that we have the effect like a switch from being off to on. So yeah, if that's considered the target, then we see that, for example, esteem number two could also uh, brings us the same effect, if I answer your question. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding uh, the transition probabilities. Uh, so do you have kind of a priori knowledge that can tell if uh, we can move from a state to another one and uh, not from uh, a given state to, 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 uh, to other states? And how do you estimate these uh, transition probabilities? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it, um, I think the semantics behind these states uh, is sh should be disease dependent. So, for example, we checked the literature and found that stage D is very uh, uh, has been studied very uh, intensively regarding the Parkinson disease. So we were very sensitive regarding state D and transition to it and from it, but. Uh, and if, if I think part of your question was related to how we could extract these transition probabilities, right? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, that's uh, so you are breaking down uh, the sequence of a time series of the EG into uh, you, you discretize it to A, B, C, D, and then instead of um, ups and downs of a time series, you only have A, 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 B, B, C, C, C. So you have a discretized set of letters that switch, uh, that change from one to another. So for, for um, calculating these transition probabilities, you only, uh, if you have the uh, extracted microstates, you only do frequency based and you count the number of transitions. So that's something very simple when you have the, when you have uh, extracted the microstat sequence out of the uh, raw time series of EEG. And there are some toolboxes, famous toolboxes to do that. So EEG lab has a toolbox and also there's a toolbox called car tool or Python. Uh, there's a Python toolbox that also um, um, does some Markov uh, assumption and Markov, Markovian calculation. So yeah, I have, uh, studied a few of the toolboxes, but finally we have performed this analysis based on EG lab toolbox. Thank you. No problem. Thank you for your presentation, Mariam. Um, somewhere in your talk, I don't know <laughs> where it was the first third. You were okay. talking about a uh, reduction of the beta band. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Beta in Parkinson's disease is one of the key factors that you want to target actually in order to reduce it um, since it's linked uh, to the symptoms, but that's usually in the striatum and uh, uh, which is actually very difficult to measure. Yeah, it was somewhere you can, can you say a few words of how you're inferring that the beta went down as a consequence of GDS and uh, mm -hmm. what, uh, what the evidence is for that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think maybe I first I have to show you the, um, oh, I think I don't have that yet. Maybe, maybe um, Sujin might be able to answer that because it's her thesis. Yeah, thank you so much. Can you help me Sujin, please? <laughs> sure. Oh yeah, so here the beta um, we measured are related to movements. So right before and during movements, the beta uh, power over the motor cortex um, like decreases. So what we looked at here is to 
well, firstly, compare how this beta desynchronization different between healthy control and uh, Parkinson's disease patient, and then how GBS affects the beta desynchronization. So what we found is that um, I think, um, if I remember correctly, uh, so um, the beta desynchronization is uh, weaker, so less desynchronization in the patient group. And the darker blue uh, shows that um, GBS um, oh, basically augmented. It, yeah, augmented the desynchronization. And jointly at the same time resulted in improved reaction time. So that's why it was a joint analysis. And the way it was detected over the motor cortex was a data driven method, right? Uh, so Jim, yeah. didn't you do CCA? Yeah. So you did which linear combination of channels uh, with beta band desynchronization was associated with uh, uh, improvements, simultaneous improvements in, in reaction time and other behavioral parameters, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So it's uh, actually in a event-related design over the motor yes. process. You look yes, at the electrodes, exactly. but probably you yes. did some source projections, yeah. Um, but it's in the motor areas, so. Yeah, it's in the motor areas. area, yes. But that was not a priori. That came out as part of the analysis that yes. it was over the motor cortex. Okay. Does it make sense that it's in the motor areas in the context of the basal ganglia subcircuits that are implied in the Parkinson disease? Sense in the context of um, uh, the, there are subcircuits that are hypothesized to create actually the additional beta activity. Uh, uh, but if I remember correctly, that is mostly in the striatal areas, yeah. Um, and uh, the target for deep brain stimulation, isn't it, that you want to reduce the beta activity in these areas? Now you're building a larger circuit and you are identifying it over the motor area. So I'm trying to get a little uh, my picture of uh, PD and uh, the corresponding networks. I'm trying to get a feeling for. What is happening here? Yeah, maybe I should. Exactly. Maybe oh, go ahead, Sujay. Oh yes, go go ahead. Yeah, Doctor, we can go ahead. Well, I, I I didn't want to put you. I thought it was a bit of an un. Uh, well, it's a difficult question. Yeah biomedical engineer. So I was just going to, you know, I think, don't forget with the DBS, uh, because the electrodes are small, the, where you're looking for is where in the entire motor circuit is a choke point that you can put your electrode in. So the subthalamic nucleus uh, is obviously fits the bill there. But that doesn't mean that's the entire motor ne network. That's just yeah. where they put the electrodes in. And I think there have been a number of VEG studies that have shown that there is widespread changes. I mean, don't forget, we weren't specifically looking over the motor cortex. We were saying which EEG channels have modulations in beta that best are best associated with reaction time and other uh, motor indices. And what it seems to indicate is that now we're not claiming that that's the entire motor uh, motor network involved in the motion. But what we're saying is that's the part of the EEG that seems to be most modulated with this event related design. Mm -hmm. If I may ask a follow up on this, why did you look for uh, beta? We looked at all things. And in fact, uh, we did beta, of course, because it's well known when the local field potentials of uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, but we looked at, I mean, Sujin can tell you, but we looked at all frequencies. And in fact, in the EEG, often it is not beta. Uh, it, it is other other uh, frequencies as well, but it, it just came out the analysis that were and also I think it's related because of this particular motor design. If you look at uh, in healthy controls, uh, you, if you look at motor performance, it's usually event related desynchronization in the beta band, even in healthy controls. But we did explore other frequencies, of course, as well. Yeah, it's exactly just to add more information. Yeah, as you know, beta or mu um, frequency band is related to movement in all like human subjects. And as you said, 
uh, beta is important for Parkinson's disease, and it's well known that the <coughs> resting state beta is is I mean, the beta power is very high in uh, Parkinson's disease patient. And that's part of the reason why their beta desynchronization level is lower in the patient group. Um, so we were interested in this frequency band in particular, but like Dr. McKeon said, we also looked at other frequency bands, but we didn't find any interesting results. Thank you. Miriam, do you, uh, as a group, do you plan to apply this strategy to other movement disorders or other degenerative disorders? Mm -hmm. Like which, which strategy specifically are you talking about? Event-related desynchronization, microstate, or deep loop, and which one? Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking of the general approach that you've used mm -hmm. to try to well, we did. We just you could tell us about the uh, reinforcement learning uh, grant, uh, Mary Ann, for dystonia. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, the question was about if it's related, if it should be specific to Parkinson or any neurodegenerative disease, right? I, I think there is no constraint that makes it specifically Parkinson uh, related because we are looking at EEG, fMRI. And um, maybe movement disorder problems uh, could be more relative here. But as Dr. McCune pointed out, we are thinking about optimization of GBS parameters interactively based on uh, EMG, uh, EMG input. So you, using deep reinforcement learning, uh, uh, we are trying to for another, we are trying to um, apply it for optimization. Uh, based on, I think, surface EMG for um, treatment of uh, uh, saliva, uh, excessive saliva. No, uh, cervical dystonia. Okay, so can you please? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I should jump in. As I said, it might not be fair. So yeah, we're certainly looking at this. There, you know, there are vestibular inputs into in B. So cervical dystonia is where people get an abnormal contraction of muscles in the neck. And the medications don't work very well and have a lot of side effects. And what's totally revolutionized the treatment of this is botulinum toxin. So uh, we inject a lot of botulinum toxin. So what we were interested in doing, unfortunately, we just submitted a grant that didn't get funded, of course. But uh, the idea was to see whether or not uh, there would be a synergistic effect between injection of botulinum toxin and um, vestibular stimulation. So uh, there are a few anecdotal um, uh, cases where you can show changes in the musculature of the neck with um, vestibular stimulation, but it's not a very robust literature. So in fact, we're gonna collect some pilot data specifically looking at this. But other than dystonia and uh, Parkinson's, um, I think that would be the main thing. I guess, could it be used for something like post-stroke rehabilitation? Yeah, maybe. I think these techniques obviously are quite general, so. Further questions in the room. Um, if there's anything else that you wanted to comment and expand on, feel free. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Miriam, for a great talk. Um, 